Welcome to The Big Break Show, a podcast where we discuss short-term rentals, entrepreneurship, life, mindset, and everything in between. Here are your hosts, Rafaloza and Jesse Vasquez. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode two of The Big Break Show. Today, we are going to be talking about short-term rentals. That's right, short-term rentals. The one topic that got us for our big break to be able to have the freedom to sit here and record these episodes. I'm here with my co-host, Jesse. Jesse, how you doing, brother? What's going on, man? This is one of my favorite topics of all time. So yeah, dude, I'm ready to kind of deep dive into this and talk to people about how they can make some money, how they can create a business out of short-term rentals, and how they can be successful and sit here and have a drink in the middle of the day while they're just chilling out. Look at you, you know all I mean? grown up having having uh, what is that whiskey in the middle of a Tuesday afternoon? What are we Monday today? I can't. I lose track of my day sometimes. Today's Monday, man, and that's that's one of the best things about being an entrepreneur is that you can chill out, have a drink in the middle of the day, and then take a nap when you get old man. like me. I love just, it. You drink at seven. Get you're not that old, bro. Come on. Except <laughs> the gray hair says otherwise. The gray hair says otherwise. I know you're right. You're you right, have sir. A drink at seven. <laughs> <laughs> you're absolutely so, right, sir. <laughs> What are we talking about today, buddy? Start so it off today, with me. Yeah, so today we're going to talk about what exactly is short-term rentals and you know how that's helped us grow our, our business, how we've been able to utilize short-term rentals through cash flow, um, how we've been able to utilize cash flow to purchase properties. We're going to talk about what types of different short-term rentals there are, getting started, what to consider before you get into short-term rentals. So that leads me to that first, Rafa. What the heck is short-term rentals? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Let's clear it up, right? Because a lot of people usually when they talk about this, they think immediately Airbnb. Oh, I started an Airbnb or, hey, I'm staying at the Airbnb or, hey, we're going to the Airbnb, which is fine because Airbnb has just done an awesome job in marketing, right? Everybody out there thinks that a short-term rental is an Airbnb. But a short-term rental is a place that you can rent out for short-term stays, right? Instead of doing a one-year lease or a six-month lease or a three-year lease, you can do a one-day minimum stay at a premium, right? Um, we can rent out any type of house, apartment, cabin, tiny house, your whatever the case may be, for a very short period of time, as little as one day uh, and as long as three years, as long as we want. So that's what a short-term rental is. Uh, would you agree? Yep. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I think that one of the biggest misconceptions with short-term rentals is, you know, how do we know we're going to get these nights booked? How do we know that, you know, how do we know we're going to get cash flow? How do we know what our occupancy is going to be? So that for me is like, how do we use short-term rentals to build cash flow? You know, and maybe I might be jumping ahead a little bit too soon. I know we were talking about what are short-term rentals, but you just kind of nailed it. And, you know, real quick is you get paid per night as opposed to one lump sum of money. And one of the best advantages of having a short-term rental is that you get to decide and your property gets to decide in this, mm. the environment that you bring it into, the, the market will tell you how much you can make per night. So quick, quick, easy way to do that is if you make $2,000 a month for, for your rental property, that would be, what is that, Rafa? $100 a night, $175 a night, something like that. Yeah, it's like, I don't know, 80 something dollars or something like that. Yeah, right. So that's what would equal out. So your average long term rental would be about $75 a day. And one of the things that I love about short term rentals is we get to create something, let's just say $200 a night. And you have $200 a night for 30 days. What does that equal out to six grand, right? So we just three x our mortgage based off of that. So it allows you to have cash flow that will super exceed any long-term rental any day of the week, which is an argument that you and I, Rafa, both get into with long-term investors on a regular basis. And they're going to come argue, around. I, yeah, yeah. I've argued with some of the top investors out there about short-term rentals, how, oh, it's too much work, or, oh, I don't know, it's worth the, it's not worth the headache, or it's not passive. And you know what? They might be right on all, on all fronts, but if you put in the work, you put in the effort, you build the systems out, man, it could be a very, very passive investment, right? Uh, speaking of, right, like Jesse talking about cash flow, we were just talking about this beforehand. I mean, yeah, I have what 20, 25 units that I've started, right? Mm -hmm. And what did I just do, right? For one year, I, I hit a milestone. And <laughs> can you believe that? Yeah, one million doll hairs this guy's got. Yeah, and, 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 and dude, flow. it's exciting, right? But that's because I was able to build that system to, and it's been very passive, right? I mean, think about that for a second. Uh, I, I was able to generate a million dollars in one year. The year's not even over yet. We still have December coming. And um, 
it was pretty much pasta for me. I, I work on the business, what, two, three hours a week, um, sometimes a little more, sometimes a, li a little less. But that's because I built out the systems, right? And when you argue with somebody, that's 23 rentals. Is anybody out there going to bring in that kind of revenue with 23 long-term rentals, do you think? Hell to the no. Right? No, I mean, yeah, yeah. If you have a billion of them, I mean, totally. No, and no, yeah, absolutely. I'm talking about with the same amount, right? 23 short-term rentals or 25, whatever it is that I have right now. Absolutely freaking not. And that, I think, is one of the biggest, most important pieces of short-term rentals is that you can make a decent amount of cash flow without even owning a home. You know what I mean? Like you don't have to own a property to do this. And this like Rafa is an example of $1 million been able, you know, he's been able to do that this year in the midst of a pandemic without even owning a single property. Like let that you know, sink in for a second. You know, the, 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 you set a goal, you aim for, you work hard and it happens and you're right. Not, I don't own anything. I don't own a single property. Right. I think, I think that could be a perfect shift into our, our part, right? What types of short-term rentals are there and how can you get started into short-term rentals? What do you think? Yeah. Oh yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So we have the arbitrage model, which Rafa, you're the expert in that. That's, that's how Rafa has been able to build his empire of 25, you know, even more than that at one point. And, you know, b being able to build that empire, you have what I do co-hosting, right? I can manage somebody else's property. I can uh, short-term rent. I also do mid-term rentals for travel medical professionals which by the way, I just got a $16,000 um, uh, $16, uh, offer today, which I, I accepted. <laughs> there you go. Um, so, I mean, those are, those are two ways. I mean, those are, you can do the 30 day plus, which is midterm market. There's short term rentals. I mean, there's rough up. I mean, what else is there, man? Am I missing something? Well, no, I mean, listen, the, the strategies are simple. It's arbitrage where you can rent someone else's property, Put in the, the effort, furnish it, right? Add value to it and re-rent it per night. Then there's yours, the co-hosting strategy where you manage other people's properties and they furnish it. They do everything. You just manage it as a short-term rental and there's revenue split, right? Um, and then there's obviously the owner side of things that you own. You do that as well, right? Um, yeah. You own the property and you just furnish it and you convert it, convert it into your very own self-managed short-term rental. Um, I think those are the top three ones. I'm sure there's other ones out there. I don't actually, I don't think there's any other ones out there. I think those are the only ones um, based on, on the strategies. Right. And that's something that I also want to make very clear, right? Short-term rentals are a strategy. It's a strategy of real estate. It's a form of real estate investment, right? It's a strategy for real estate investment, actually, if we're saying that correctly. And um, there's no wrong way to go about it, right? It, it's going to be based on what your goals are, what, what you're thinking you want to do, what you want to get to in life, right? Everybody thinks that what I'm doing is stupid. Well, you don't own anything. Yeah, I don't. I, I have no no assets at all. Like, I, I own a car, right? Um, but here's the thing. That's my strategy of where I was at in life when I started. I'm still there. I have a goal and I'm sticking to it, right? Am I wrong? Maybe in someone else's eye, maybe in a long-term buy and hold investor's eyes, I'm wrong. But am I wrong in the eyes of everybody else who doesn't even have one investment in their life? They probably think I'm a genius, right? Uh, am I wrong in, 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 the, in the eyes of a real estate investor who holds long-term buy and hold who's making $200 a month, they probably think I'm a genius as well because I'm bringing in 1500 bucks to $2,000 a month off of someone else's property. And that's just because I use a very specific strategy within the short-term rental um, asset class of real estate. Does that make sense? And that's per property. Per property. Like per property. $1,500 yeah. to 2000 per property. Minimum. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, think about it. How, how else? Okay. 25 properties and mind you guys, anybody listening to this, this isn't, this isn't boasting or showing off. We're trying to make this very clear, right? 25 properties. Um, I didn't have 25 when I started the year. Um, I actually had to close a lot down because of the pandemic, but I rebuilt them. So th this, this milestone, actually a, a large part of it came from March to today, which were what middle of November. Um, and November. in order to get there, I had to pick very specific properties, but get to very specific points and topics of, of where we're going. Right. I, uh, I mean, it, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of where, where I'm at. And it, it, if you go back to it and you put it all two and two together, how, how much, how much, how many properties going back to what we were talking about earlier, Jesse, how many properties do we actually uh, a long-term buy and hold investor have to have in order to get to that, to that point in revenue? Right. 
Right. Yeah. I've talked to people before um, they invest out of state and a lot of times they're like, yeah, I'm going to make $200 per property. And man, um, when I sit there and I think about that, I'm like, holy crap, you're only going to make $200. And this is just rent. This is long-term rent. So that's five properties just to make a thousand. Right. And then, so for you to make $1,500 per property, I would literally have to own six or seven properties to be able to make that passive cash flow per month. So just let that sink in for a second. Cause that's, that's the reality of it. You know, two to two to $300. That's like, that's good cash flow for a lot of people per property. And yes, you are getting the equity side of that too, in some cases. And you also have depreciation on a lot of other ends. So those are also things to think about. Like, you know, when you're investing in real estate, you know, or you're doing it as an arbitrage deal, like you're doing now, you know what I mean? There's, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but I think for you, Rafa now, and this is something I wanted to ask you, and, and this is kind of off topic with our questions right now. So I'm going to go off. I'm going to steer off the, the edge here a little bit. If you had to start over again today with the model that you have, the, with the arbitrage model, we talked about it a second ago, what types of short-term rentals are there? What type of models are there? Would you do the same thing that you did before to where you are now? You mean before I did short-term rentals? Or if, if you were starting off today with short-term rentals, would you think about going into arbitrage again? Would you think about buying something earlier? Where would you start today? What niche, what what type of customer would you want to serve? Would you start in the same area because you're in Los Angeles? Where would you what would you do now? Yeah, uh, I mean, number one, yeah, I would start with arbitrage 100%. Um, and here's why, right? And again, it depends on everybody's strategy. But my strategy, if I, if I were to lose everything today and say, hey, tomorrow you start at zero, here's $10,000. It's very difficult to go out and buy a property with $10,000 and start having a cash flow. It's, it's near impossible. Um, but with $10,000, I can go and open a one-bedroom apartment, serve a very specific customer, which is the medical professional, the, the business professional, the business traveler, the traveling nomad, um, the small couple, right? The boyfriend, girlfriend, um, the, the mom, dad with the child, right? Those are the people I target um, because those are the people who are constantly traveling year-round. So if I were to start over, it would 100% be arbitrage because with $10,000, I can open a one bedroom apartment that will cash flow me again, a minimum of a thousand to $1,500, $1,500 bucks is my sweet spot. Now I don't do anything under that, um, but $1,500 per month on average for the year. And if I, if I, if I hold on to that one long enough in 10 months, nine months, eight months, I can have those 10 grand back and open a second one, right? If I'm sticking strictly to that one unit, not looking for other sources of income, uh, not working with investors to borrow money, not, not going out and getting personal loans to get started. None of that stuff. One short-term rental, $10,000, eight months, get my money back, open a second one, eight months, get my money back, open the third one, eight months, get my money back, open the fourth one. We're looking at 24 months, two years, four short-term rentals operating, making me a ton of cash flow, right? A ton of cash flow. Uh, absolutely. Yep. That's what I would 100% yeah. do. So you would still take that same model knowing what you know today. Like if you just started back in 2016 or 2017, whenever you started, you would still move that. So there it is, folks. Rafa would still take the same approach as he did before, making a million dollars in one year, actually less than a year. You're it's, it's just it's just the easiest. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. It's just the easiest. <laughs> it's just the easiest route for me. Not only not only is it easy, you start with little money and listen, the risk. It's high, but the risk is low at the same time because you're really risking only ten thousand dollars. And the risk about it is that if you're not operating correctly, then you might get kicked out and you have to go somewhere else. But, you know, treat it right. I keep talking about this in every podcast I do. Treat it right and treat it as a business. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that, that leads me to this now, which is why I wanted to talk to you about that. What does somebody need to do today to get started? And you and I know that we've, we've talked to hundreds of people, thousands of people on Clubhouse or in-person meetups, you know, things like that. This is a question that I get asked all the time. You know, what do I need to do to get started? So where would you, what would you, what would be your first, what would be the first start? Where, where would you tell somebody right now? Like, the, here's the number one thing you need to do today to get out there and make some money get get educated get educated what does that mean? Uh, yeah. break that down okay so for example if you start if you say hey i want to go open a short term rental on arbitrage like rafa's doing and you go out and you start making phone calls and you say hey you know i'm trying to start an airbnb you're going to get the boot out the door i it's very rare and there does it's not saying that it won't happen but it's very rare 
to get a person to say yes to an Airbnb apartment in their property or in that location. Um, I would I would get educated to be able to to pro professionally or precisely ask targeted questions to that owner or that complex to where they allow me to operate there. So when they have a question, I can answer it with ease, with expertise and with knowledge and getting educated as to how short term rentals work, what they are, how, how they're managed, um, what your daily revenue is, um, the type of moving parts that are involved. Get educated about all of that. When somebody asks you a question like, how are you going to deal with somebody having a party in my house? And you go, well, um, uh, 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 and you stutter, you're done. But if you learn and get educated beforehand and they go, well, listen, we have a security procedure in place that stops noise. We have a noise decibel monitor. Uh, we have doorbell cameras. We require IDs. We make sure that the person who booked is the person who walks in through the door. You see how different it sounds? And they're going to go, okay, this guy really knows what they're talking about. So the first thing that I would 100% do is get educated about the business and learn the ins and outs. Uh, not the, I'm sorry, I take that back. You don't have to learn the ins and outs of the business, but learn what the business actually is, what's actually required to run the business, and then go out and actually just get started. Just get started. Literally pick up the phone and make a phone call. Yeah, I think you're so right on that when you say, you know, get educated. And one of the things that I always preach is education before compensation. Like you have to become educated in something, whether that's taking a class, you know, a master class or an online course or you know, the school of YouTube, like I, I went to, that's what I did. Like I went to, like it was an actual school, YouTube university, but YouTube university. It is, it is actually real. Like that's how I learned about short-term rentals. And it, as entrepreneurs, you just kind of dive into things sometimes and you figure it out as you go. But in this case, there's so much, there's so much information out there now that's free that you can get out and learn about. And I think, you know, this is another question too. Uh, I hear this all the time. There's a lot of people that bash coaches or mentors like rafa what do you think about coaches or mentors do you think somebody getting started should have that do you think they should go into that class and be careful what you say because i do have a course no listen i i love it i i i am a big big fan of coaches and mentors um whether it's somebody that you work with one-on-one -on -one, whether it's courses whether it's youtube university those are all coaches and mentors um i'm a fan of it i started with the mentor um, it helped me get my foot off the ground. It, it helped me um, get the confidence to be able to know what I'm doing because I got educated first. Right. But here's the thing, any coach or mentor, depending on how you get that person or that video or whatever it is that you're using should help you get from point A to point B in a very straight line and should help you get to where you need to get very easily and streamlined, right? If it makes your life more complicated, if it makes it harder for you, then you're probably not looking at the right coach or the right mentor. Um, because if I were to, if I, like, for example, if I want to learn about um, traveling medical contracts like you do, Jesse, there's nobody out there that's going to teach me. I would have to go out there and kind of start figuring it out by making phone calls every day and talking to people and tr trying to see what's going on. Or I could go to you and say, hey, man, teach me, Right. But if right. and then I go and I sign up to your course, my expectation is that you're going to help me get from not knowing anything to knowing a lot to be able to make that first phone call and be able to get somewhere along the lines of figuring out how to get a contract through that right person. Right. If, if your course doesn't help me get there, then that's not the right course for me. It's not the right mentorship program for me. Right. I'm a big fan of a man. I mean, I, even for anything, I've when I learned how to sculpt, I learned how to sculpt tools and painting by watching other people doing it that's a form of mentorship that's a form of coaching yeah. um I, I ask people hey how do you how do you do silicone molds right what's the right tool to be able to create a a a, uh, a mold out of silicone and again this, we're getting off topic here but we're talking about my artist side of things right where i didn't know how to make a a, a, a um a, a casted piece from liquid material that turns into a plastic piece that I can paint on. Um, I, somebody had to help me get there. Right. Yep. And yeah. it, it started by asking questions and talking to the right people, getting a mentor and a coach. Yeah. No, that answers it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that, I think that does answer it. And I think a lot of times too, that people need guidance and that's exactly what a coach does is they'll guide you along through something that can be very difficult and teach you how to navigate the things that they've already done. And I think for me, that's what coaching is about. It's, it's somebody that is able to really teach somebody in a simple way 
how to navigate all the issues that usually will typically arise, all the shortcuts that are there that are available to people that are influenced or understand that already and have been through and been there and done that. You know what I mean? And that's where I feel there's coaches everywhere and gurus everywhere now. We know that, right? Like you can throw a rock and hit a, a guru. Like literally, I just did that outside before we got on this call. <laughs> and, <laughs> and my neighbor was like, hey, what the hell? Hit? So yeah, like literally that happened. I'm not kidding. Um, I don't know what he's a coaching, but my rock just ended on his head. But anyway, I went off topic with that. <laughs> but dude, <laughs> that was great. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is make sure that the person that you're going to get coaching from really understands what they're doing. Cause there's a ton of people out there teaching a ton of uh, stuff and some that are really freaking badass too. Like some that are fantastic at what they're doing. There's others that aren't so great and I'm not calling any names out. I don't even know these people cause they're not even on my radar, but there's a lot of good information and a lot of bad information out there. So pick and choose wisely, my friends. Um, and, and you so know what though, Jesse too, one last thing, right? I get, I get asked all the time, Hey, do you coach? Do you mentor? And I don't, because I can't dedicate the time required to someone for me to do one-on-one -on -one coaching or one-on-one -on -one mentoring. So keep that in mind. If you do get one-on-one -on -one coaching and mentoring from someone, there has to be an expectation set, right? Um, if they don't have the time that you're requiring, it might not be the right fit for you. If they do give you the time, but it's not the time that you want, it might not be the right fit for you. And keep that in mind as well when doing one-on-one -on -one coaching with people, as well as um, who you work with, like you said. Sorry, go ahead. No, you're <laughs> absolutely right. I think that's important. One-on-one -on -one calls are... You know, those are those are the most difficult, but they're also the most rewarding. When you hear, you know, somebody's story, or they got a, they finally got a hold hold of that recruiter, or they finally got that first booking. So those are the things, and that's what I did before, dude. Like my job before, I was a sales like mentor, sales coach, and that's what I did with my team. It's like I was teaching them. So this is like second nature to me, which is what I love. Um, but I'm just not good at putting all the pieces together to start a coaching program. Rafa, you're in the same boat, dude. I know you are too. All we got to do is get you somebody to get to get your programs together for you. Do a little bit of work here and there, and then you're good, man. We're going to work on that, everybody. Rafa's going to have his own program here shortly, which is <laughs> which hey, is going to lead hey. me which is going to lead me into the next segment right here, Rafa. What are things to consider before getting into short-term rentals? Like what are the let's just say the top 3 things to think about before getting into short-term rentals? Number 1, the amount of risk that you can tolerate. I think that's a big one. Uh, because it will decide what, where and what you're going to going to put your money in, the amount of work you're going to put in, the amount of stress you're willing to put up with. I mean, listen, I, it's, I've been doing this for, what, four, a little bit over four years, four and a half years, something like that. Um, Let's break that down real quick. So the amount of risk. So what, what you mean by that is really you need to hammer down on what your market's going to be able to do for you. Well, in a way. No, the not necessarily. Put up front. No, no, no. Not necessarily just the market. I'm talking about the stress levels you're willing to put up, the sacrifices you're willing to do, the amount of risk means what you're willing to risk to get started, right? Are you willing to risk your time? Are you willing to risk a certain amount of money? How much money are you willing to risk, right? Um, how much stress can you really deal with? I, I, I mean, the amount, it's your risk level. What can, how strong of a person are you to be able to put up $10,000 that you've been saving up for the last year that could potentially be lost in the next couple of months. Th that's risk. You got to tolerate your risk. You got to know, and you got to go out and maybe just give it a shot. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think risk tolerance is important with a lot of investing in general. You have to have that kind of spine. But also, I think, and maybe you're going to go into this in here in a second, you can mitigate a lot of risk if you start looking at numbers and if they make sense in a way. You talked about, you know, 10 minutes ago that you want to earn your money back within the first eight to 10 months. And that's by knowing what your market's going to be able to produce. So is that what you're going to go into next? Or go yeah. Ahead? Yeah. Well, it, it was the, the part of the risk part was because knowing the risk that you're willing to take on will really tell you how to prepare yourself for that. Because if you say, hey, I have $10,000 and I don't want to lose them, then you're going to educate yourself as much as you possibly can to be able to not lose those 10 grand. You're mitigating risk by educating yourself on how the market's doing the type of customers you're going to bring. And again, we're talking strictly short-term rentals, right? The way you're going to price your unit is huge, right? Everybody always goes, well, I can get a unit. Yeah, any listen, anybody out there can open a short-term rental with as little as probably $3,000. Yeah. But is that short-term rental really going to generate the amount of revenue that you're trying to get out of it? I can't get $1,500 out of a short-term rental with $3,000. I just can't, right? Um, and mm -hmm. I'm in an awesome market. Um, 
So competitive market too. Yeah. And in a very competitive market, right? Educating yourself and mitigating risk is, is the, one of the things that you really definitely have to do and consider before getting started in short-term rentals, right? Consider what your daily rates are. Consider the type of customer you're going to be bringing. Consider the type of decor you want to put into your place. The type of decor will, will go hand in hand with the amount of money you make per night, which goes in hand with the, the amount of profit you make per month. Right. Um, and then decide the type of strategy and short term rentals that you want to go into. Do you want to go into the arbitrage model? Do you want to go into the co-hosting model? Or do you want to go and buy a property and convert it into a short term rental? None of them are wrong, but it depends on where you are at that point in time in life. Right. Yeah. And that's the, the thing that really you have to get considered because I can listen. I can come in here and go, Jesse, what you're doing is wrong. Stop buying properties Take your $40,000 that you're putting in as a down payment and go open four arbitrage one bedroom apartments that are going to make you $4,400 a month. Go do that instead. I but then you, you go, that. yeah, well, I have, <laughs> but, I, but, but you, but then you go, Hey, listen, that's not where, that's not where I'm at. That's not my strategy right now. I'm, I'm in a comfortable situation in life where I don't need that kind of cash flow right now, where I want that long-term um, wealth, where I know that if I buy a property today with those 40 grand in 20 years, it's going to be worth a whole lot more money. And I'm going to make decent cash flow off that property. Right. But if you were in a situation where you go, Hey, I really want to quit my job. Rafa, what do I do? I'm tired of it. I have 50 grand. I'm thinking of going and buying one house so that I can cash flow about 1500 bucks a month, maybe three grand a month. What do you think? Right. I'm going to be like, dude, take those 50 grand and go open five units because those five units are going to cash flow you enough to, to go and, and quit your job. That's going to yep. be, your, it's now going to be your supplemental income. Right. And you're going to say, holy crap, that's a great idea. I think I'm going to do that. But that's because that's where you're at in life. Right. Anybody who listens to this, always take advice with a grain of salt and pick and choose what works for you. Because my strategy won't work for the guy next to me. My strategy won't work for the guy behind me. Their strategy is not going to work for me. It's going to be based on where I am in life, right? I just, today I got accepted on an offer on a house. And for how long did I not want to, yeah, thanks. How <laughs> long did I not want to buy a property for Jesse, right? How long has it been? And I said, you know what? Time, I'm man. now at the point in time where instead of opening more arbitrage units, I should maybe put some money into some actual properties for the future because now I'm setting up for the future because it took me four years to get to this point. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. So that was two things. So the last thing before we move on to the next, next segment, what are things to consider before getting into short term rentals? What would be the third number three? Quick, simple, easy. I think the the, the biggest thing to consider would be your mark with the market of where where you're going to open it. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so I, th I, I think the, the biggest thing to consider is um, your market of where you're going to open the short term rental. That That's yeah. that's kind of a big one. Yeah. And everything's every single thing to consider is what works best for one person might not neck might not work for the next person behind me so like i'm gonna give you guys an example of what works for me i i do what's a hybrid model so i have long-term nurses that are in for midterm actually midterm nurses that are in from 30 to 90 days i supplement that with short-term rentals that are two days two night minimums um and then i'm also able to to get longer term tenants in there or not longer term but but longer stays so it's basically like a hybrid model. And then now we're even talking about peer space now. And that's something I'm dabbling into as well. So there's multiple different ways to get into short-term rentals. And I think this hybrid model is probably the way you want to go moving forward is that you have a mix of, you know, buy and holds. You have a mix of arbitrage. You have a mix of certain clientele in each property. You have a high-end home and you have a, you know, a mid home. And then you have like a two bedroom, simple cookie cutter, easy for somebody to get in and out. But it's decorated the right way that has appearance, that has structure behind it. And then you even create your own. You create something in your market that nobody else has anything like. So you're creating your own, you know, your own market in that essence. You're not having to compete with anybody. You're not competing with the Joneses down the street. You're actually creating your own, you know, your own short term rental that has its own kind of entity around it. So that would be somebody else's comp when they look at it. And I think those are things that we don't talk about enough that as short-term rentals continue to progress, you're going to want to have a model that basically mixes every single one of those things we just talked about right now, you know, going forward. I think that's what a true hybrid model is going to be um, with short-term rentals. You know, when you look at it in those essence or midterm stays there, there's a mix of everything. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, listen, short-term rentals are awesome. There's so many different ways to go about it, right? Even an arbitrage, even that, like some of my three bedrooms do killer, 
right? Compared to the one bedrooms. Um, I used to have nothing but two bedrooms. Um, now I focus on one bedrooms because I shifted the type of customer that I'm trying to serve and attract and house. Um, and I don't think there's a wrong answer because if I were to buy a three bedroom house, I know that it would still do awesome. And I know that I can probably generate the type of cash flow that I want to do anyway. So um, yeah, I, I think you're 100% correct, man. Yeah, no, I don't think I know my friend. <laughs> and this is one of the things that I think that us is, I'm trying to sell, I don't sound like an asshole, but I really, I want people to realize like the, there's a lot of opportunity on the floor right now, on the streets, on the infrastructure bill that just passed. We're watching the shifts with the, the, the travel medical professionals. There's a market that's enormous. We're talking about digital nomads. Like everything is out there for us to see right now, right? We all know that. So now we implement something and we create around that niche. And that's where we're going to have longevity and we're going to be able to grow as entrepreneurs, as short-term rental operators, as business owners. Um, so that leads me into this, Rafa. I think we're getting close to, to closing out here. So what's the goals for Rafa? And what's, what's, what's in store for you? Every year at the end of the year, I sit down or not at the end of the year, but at the beginning of the year, I sit down and I write everything down that I did last year for what I accomplished, what I what was aiming to accomplish. And then I compare it to what I can possibly do in 2022. Well, I this year I came to it was a decision. I, I had, one of my goals was to save my short term rental business because of COVID. I was really scared that I was going to, you know, end. Um, and so I said, you know what, I either shut down or I get together. And I, I, I you know, strapped up my jeans and got to work and um, I made it work. And my goal was to 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 save my short-term rental business, which I did. My second goal was to buy my parents a house, which I did. My third goal was to hit a million dollars, which I did, which is nice. Amazing. Yeah. And so for 2022, I think going into, it's going to be something based off of that, right? I'm going to aim for two, for $2 million in 2022, right? We were just talking about this beforehand. I can't wait yeah. till I get to that $1 billion mark. At some point, by the time I'm old, I will get to that $1 billion mark. Um, but for, for 2022, I'm trying to get to $2 million, right? I'm trying to buy one new house every single month in 2022 purchase. Um, I'm trying to hit that 50 unit arbitrage mark by the end of 2022. Those are my goals off the top of my head for right now. Business goals, short-term rental goals, I mean, because obviously, you know, I have personal goals. I have friendship goals, relationship goals. I have spiritual goals. I have the full frame circle that I go over where I'm at in life at that point. But based on my business and my short-term rentals and my investing, um, and I want to diversify my portfolio, right? I'm now slowly getting into a little bit of crypto, a little percentage of my money. Um, I'm purchasing stocks. Before, it was a one-lane kind of guy where I didn't want to steer from the lane, and I wanted to focus strictly on that one thing, which was short-term rentals. I lost a lot of opportunities because all I, I had my one eye open only for short-term rentals, right? Yeah. I didn't yeah. want to look to the left or look to the right. In 2022, I'm definitely going to keep an eye out open for new opportunities, but in, in short-term rental speaking, yeah, buy a new house every single month, hit $2 million, um, and go from there. What about you, man? What g Give me yours. For next year, um, actually, I have my goals written down. Let me let me go through these with you, sir. All right. So Tell me what that. 20, and this, you know what? This is something I hope and implore everybody listening to this. When you're done with this podcast, get a piece of notepaper, grab something, and start writing your goals down. As a matter of fact, Jesse, I think that we're going to uh, do a episode just on goals. We should do it. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Before I the end of the year, we should. This I'm gonna I'm gonna end it with this. Or talk about this real quick before I go into. A lot of people spend a lot of time learning about other people's things. Which what I mean by that is they have conversations with new people that they meet. They're asking all these questions, and a lot of those questions do not get asked themselves. Like, what do I want to do this year? What are my goals for this month? You know, where do I want to be in the next six months? What's something that I enjoy doing? Like you ask people something like that sometimes, dude, and I've watched it and they're like, um, they don't know what to say. Like literally start asking yourself the simple questions that you ask other people every day. And you'll learn a lot of stuff about yourself. I think we spend a lot of time on social media. We spend a lot of time, you know, doing things. We don't spend time learning about ourselves. Yeah. Um, but that being said, some of the goals that I have for, uh, you know, for this year is, um, I'm going to spend more time with myself. I, I I always need to be around people. And I think that I need to spend for 2022. I need to spend more time by myself, um, learning about myself, uh, pay, paying attention to, to, to some of the ways I react to things. Um, that's just a personal side. The business side, I want to 
just like you want to buy more properties. I think I want to buy two or three more properties next year. Um, I want to buy three to four to five properties with somebody else. So by the end of next year, I will have about seven, seven new properties, hopefully two or three on my own and three to four with other people. That's something that I'm learning how to do is work more with other people. With real estate in business, you cannot do stuff on your own. It, it, you can, but it's going to, you can expedite your growth, your ability to work with other people by connecting with others. There you go. You just, you just whistled it. That's super important for everybody to realize because myself, I used to only do everything on my own. And Rafa, you probably did the same. And I think now as we start getting more involved with real estate, real estate's one of those things that you have to be connected to people in some way or one way or another. And those deals are going to come to you that way. Those opportunities will come to you that way. Um, I believe in laws of attraction. And a lot of that stuff involves other people, circumstances, situations. Those are real and you have to have other people involved. So those are some of the goals that I have, man, for 2022. Yeah, man. Listen, I love it. I, your first goal about spending more time by yourself is huge. I, I absolutely love that. Um, I might actually copy you and implement that because I am infamous for not being able to be alone by myself. I just can't. Yeah. I need to have someone around me at all times. I need to be around someone. I need to be able to share my thoughts, be able to talk about it. I mean, shit, we're doing the podcast together, right? Because I didn't <laughs> want to do a podcast by myself. I'm sure you don't want to do a podcast by yourself, right? Like I need yeah. to be able to talk with someone. And so getting, uh, I don't think I've ever actually walked into a movie theater by myself before. And I know people it, will do that and it's like, it's awesome, right? They say, talk I've about done it. it. I, I think I'm going to do that. Yeah, man. I think I'm going to spend a little bit more time by myself, do a trip, go out, spend a week alone, do something, right? I, I Hey, and listen, I, I got to tell you that you kind of inspired me just now because I, I got to rethink that whole thing, right? It's how we become a better person and how we kind of see ourselves from within, how we can become better people, become better friends, better humans, better partners, right? Yeah. And it starts by analyzing yourself and, and talking from there. Man, listen, this was awesome. I know that we were talking about short-term rentals, but it turned out to be really good. You kind of turned it into yeah. a Q&A and I love it because I want people to really understand. So, um, you know, you you want to you wanna close this out? Get going? Yeah. Where can people yeah, find man. you? Yep. So you can find me at Air Venture Hosting Company, uh, Air Venture Hosting Co. at uh, Instagram and on Facebook. Um, I also have a master class that I have for short term rentals, actually midterm rentals for travel medical professionals, which is going live here soon. We're actually live now. Um, and then you can also find us, Rafa, on our, our big break um, on Facebook. Airbnb, Airbnb the big break. Airbnb, the big break on Facebook. And then also we're on Clubhouse, um, Airbnb, the big break on there as well. Yeah. Right and there. yeah. So, uh, Obviously, Instagram is the easiest way to get a hold of me, guys. Yeah. If you guys have any questions, Rafa underscore Loza. It's R-A-F-A -A underscore L-Z-A. Check the show notes. We're going to put it underneath us. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're following us, um, if you have any questions regarding that, if you guys want to learn more about short-term rentals, we have Airbnb, The Big Break on Facebook. Um, that's really the best way to get a hold of us. And just stay tuned, right? Because the podcast is also going to be coming along with the YouTube channel. For those of you listening to a podcast format, we thank you for being here. For those of you who are watching... Awesome. Like the video, drop a comment. We'll make more of these. We love you all. Thanks for being here. Thanks, everybody.